Good morning. Welcome to the online worship service for Aylmer Baptist Church. We're so glad you were able to join with us today, and we trust that as we worship together, you will feel God's presence and blessing among you. As always, our musical director, Carol McFadden, is providing some very good music along with some members of the choir. There will also be a children's story this morning, so make sure that you let them know and uh, gather around when it comes that time. Thank you for coming, and I, we do hope that you will feel God's presence today. Let's take a moment and prepare ourselves for worship. The Lord entered into covenant with Abraham and Sarah. And not only with them, but also with us. At times they doubted because of their age. And at times we doubt because of our sin. But the Lord is God, and the covenant is everlasting. Come, let us celebrate our covenant with the Lord. Let us join together in prayer. 
O Lord, our Heavenly Father, enlighten our minds and give us a firm and abiding trust in your love and care. Silence our fears and dispel our doubts that rising above our afflictions and anxieties, we may rest in you, the rock of everlasting strength. Amen. An unknown author once wrote, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. At the end of this service, you will see the many ways in which you can contribute to the work and ministry of this church. We pray that you will be able to give generously to that work. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we present our offerings to you. We realize these gifts are in no sense an equivalent for what you have done for us. But please accept these, our gifts, and help us that in the struggle for worldly comforts, we may not forget to return to you our offerings in gratitude for the many blessings you have given us. Amen. Hello. It's time for our special moment with the children. So gather around, and I'm going to tell you a story. This particular story is about a young boy, probably eight or nine years old, maybe just about your age. And his name is David. Now, David liked to climb trees. Oh, he loved to climb all kinds of trees everywhere. But at his house, there were no trees. He didn't have any trees in his neighborhood to climb at all. But his grandmother had some most wonderful trees in her yard. So every week, David's dad would go visit his grandmother. And when he went, David would go along too, because he knew that, yes, there might be some work to do, but he could also have time to go out in the back and climb some trees. Well, on one occasion, sure enough, David's dad called, you want to go to Grandma's house? Yes, he did. So off they went, and when they got there, David said, could I go outside and play? Sure enough, away he went. Oh, on his way, though, 
His dad said, make sure you don't climb the trees in the backyard. Oh, David was so disappointed. That's why he came. Anyway, he went into the backyard, and he could see the log pile and the shed and the fence and all great things to climb, but he had his heart set on climbing a tree. Well, he wandered around for a little bit, couldn't find much to look at or do, so he wandered into the front yard. And when he went into the front yard, there it was, the most magnificent tree he had ever seen. It was huge. It went way up into the air, and the branches spread out almost from fence to fence. It was gorgeous. But then he remembered his dad said, no climbing trees. Oh, wait a minute, he said. He said, no climbing trees in the backyard. I'm in the front yard, so this will be just fine. So he started, and he looked at that tree. Oh, it was magnificent. He looked up at that first branch. It was big and round and gorgeous. He jumped up, couldn't touch it. He ran and jumped up again and just barely touched the bottom edge of the branch. Oh, this was disappointing to David. Then he thought a moment, and he said, wait a minute, there might be something in the backyard. So back he went, and sure enough, right beside the shed was a beautiful wooden box. He dragged the box right out to the front yard, placed it underneath that limb, and got a running start, hit the box, and jumped up. Yes, he was there. He grabbed the branch and swung his legs up and sat there triumphantly. Well, this was exciting. He was up on the tree. But all he could see was the fence and the porch. Maybe if he climbed a little higher, he could see more. So sure enough, up he climbed branch by branch. It was almost like a ladder as he went up and up into some middle of the tree and the branches got a little bit smaller and he stopped (coughs) and he said, look at that. I can see all the way down the street. I can see Mrs. Jones' dog on a leash over in that yard. And I can see the market back there. But I can't quite see. Sure, let's climb a little higher. So up he went, up to where the branches got very thin. And he looked out. Oh, this was wonderful. He could see down to the end of the street. He could see all the way downtown. If he looked that way, he could see across the river. And if he looked up, he could see the fluffy white clouds. And if he looked down, oh no. He was really high. And he was frightened. He didn't know what to do. So he just grabbed the tree trunk just a little bit harder and sat there and couldn't move. Well, his brain told his foot to move, but his foot wouldn't move. He just sat there. He wasn't sure what was going to happen. And then he realized the sun was starting to go down. What if it gets dark, he said. And and if it gets dark, it'll get cold. And maybe I'll be left here and I'll freeze to death. Well, this made him even more frightened, and he didn't know what to do. And then he thought, and what if if my dad leaves and forgets all about me? Maybe he'll find somebody else, and I won't be remembered at all. Well, this really made him afraid. And then he heard it. His grandmother had an old wooden screen door that when you opened it up, it creaked open and then slapped shut. And he could hear footsteps on the wooden porch, one after the other. He knew those footsteps. They were his dad's footsteps. Now he was even more frightened. His dad was coming. And he heard the steps come across the porch and stepped onto the grass. And then he could see his dad looking around and he said, David, it's time to go. Let's go. David didn't say anything. He was too frightened to say anything or to move. He watched his dad go around, looked under the porch, looked over the fence. And then he saw his dad stop under the tree. 
And his dad looked around, and sure enough, he saw the box. And his dad looked at the box, and then his head gradually went up and up and up until he saw a little boy at the very top of the tree. David, what are you doing up there? Nothing, said David. Well, come on, it's time to go. David didn't move. He couldn't. And then his dad said, can you get down from there? Um, I don't think so, said David. Ah, oh, well, stay right where you are. Well, David couldn't move, so yes, he was going to stay right where he was. Then he watched his dad reach up and grab that branch and swing his leg over. He didn't even need the box. And up his dad climbed one branch after another, up to the middle and right up to where David was sitting. And David's dad put his arm around him, and together they climbed all the way back down to the ground. Well, I have to tell you, yes, David did get a punishment for disobeying his father, but he also learned something else. He learned that his father loved him, his father cared for him, and that no matter what David did, his father was going to be right there to help him. David also learned something about God that day. He learned that God, too, cares and loves us, and that God will always be right there even when we disobey. I'd like you to remember that story and remember that God loves you. Well, that's it for now. Take care and be good. When we come to God in prayer, we can bring to him our confessions, we can bring to him our thanksgivings and our requests. So let us come to God in prayer. We confess, O God, as your children, our hardness, indifference, and impenitence. We confess that we have failed to live pure and holy lives that we have trusted in ourselves and misused your gifts, and that we have not been good witnesses before the world. Give us, O God, grace to amend our sinful lives and the comfort of your Spirit to overcome and heal all our ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We can be assured that God is with us in our struggles to live faithful, loving lives. God does not condemn us when we fail, but rather God is beside us, helping us to begin again. No matter what has happened, we can start over. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the benefits that, have, that we have received from your goodness, for our creation and preservation, for those who have loved and nurtured us, for those who have befriended us and made smooth the path, for every opportunity of making beauty or of being good. Most of all, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. O oh God, give to your church a new vision and a new wisdom, a fresh understanding that the eternal message of your Son 
may be hailed as the good news of this age. Give to each one of us, O Lord, a reverence for the truth, a desire both to think and to speak truly, and save us from ever being afraid of the truth, for it is part of the revelation of yourself and part of your perfect righteousness. Give to us all the appreciation of loveliness and beauty and teach us a great reverence for it as being also part of your creation. Increase in us, O God, the desire to see justice established among people and to hasten the day when love shall rule in our social and industrial life and when no one shall enrich himself at others' expense or live indifferent to others' needs and claims. It is in that spirit, O God, that we pray for others. We pray for all faithful people and followers of the way of the cross, for those who are asking honest questions, lest they lose the way, for those who know all the answers, lest they become proud. We pray for those who are discouraged, lest they give up in despair, and for those who will not accept changes, lest they become inflexible, and for those who change with every fad and fancy, lest they lose their direction. And we pray for those who have the faith, but not the love. For all these, hear our prayer, O God. Amen. Responsive reading this morning is based on Psalm 77. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, 
and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated, and my spirit asked, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his, unfa- has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal, the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. The scripture reading is from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 to 15. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, Who will descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Our New Testament scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Well, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind... He was afraid, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God.
standing on the edge of a cliff in the darkness, lost his footing as the earth crumbled away from beneath him. And as he fell, he grasped for anything he could find until his hand reached upon a limb that was sticking out from the side of the, the cliff. What the man didn't know was that he was actually dangling just a few inches above solid ground. And as he hung there, suspended in space, he cried out, Is there anyone up there who can help me? A moment later, a voice answered him, Just let go of the limb, you'll be fine. Well, the man hung there for a moment, reflecting on what he had heard, and then he called out again, Is there anyone else up there? He apparently had some doubts, doubts about what he had heard. Doubt creeps into many facets of our lives, advertising, politics, even religion. Now, doubt is not necessarily a bad thing. There are times when we must question what is going on around us, when we must test the validity we must ask ourselves whether the sales pitch is true or is it hype. We must ask ourselves whether, we, whether what we've been offered is real or is it a false promise. Well, sometimes, though, our doubt causes us great harm. <clears throat> it may even put our faith in peril. Our text from Matthew carries us into a story in which doubt is a major factor. Now, we know from John's account of this story that the disciples wanted Jesus to mobilize the Jewish people and to overtake the Romans who ruled them. But Jesus was just not acting in the way they wanted him to. They had not been able to persuade him to exert his God-given power to deliver the people from Roman domination as they had expected the long-awaited Messiah to do. Now, they had just witnessed Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000, which only served to stir their curiosity and their interest. So they probably began to pressure Jesus again, to pressure him about when would he begin his political campaign. Now, I can imagine Jesus grew tired of listening to the disciples pressuring him to do things their way. He was likely even angry with them at times for not taking his word on the matter. So Jesus took control of the situation. He dismissed the crowds, and he sent his disciples away. In effect, he sent them home. The Scripture says he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side of Lake Galilee. Finally, Jesus was alone. That's what he wanted. He needed the solitude to regain his composure. He needed an uninterrupted time and place for prayer, for guidance from the Father, and strength to continue. Now, the disciples, the disciples who'd been sent away in the boat in the middle of the night, were feeling dejected. Jesus obviously didn't like their perspective on the subject of his role and his mission. And mixed in with those feelings was surely some anger. For here they were, grown men, sent away like children, banished to a corner for punishment. They were afraid for their future. They were afraid for the future of their nation. They were afraid that they may have been wrong about putting their confidence in Jesus and about their inclination to relate to him as being sent from God as the Messiah. They were also afraid for some very practical reasons. They were in a small boat in the middle of the lake in the middle of the night and the wind was blowing, and the waves were getting rough. Well, at the fourth watch of the night, that is, 
somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., the disciples saw something approaching the boat. At first, it was just a, a shape in the distance to which they didn't pay much attention. But it came closer and closer to them. Finally, they could see that that shape was actually the figure of a person step by step walking toward the boat. Now, there was nothing to be walking on out there but the water itself. And their hearts sank. Even the hearts of the brave and experienced fishermen became concerned. Somebody said, it's a ghost. They all began to scream out in fear. There were calls for help to whomever might hear, and they were sure that they would never see dry land or the light of day again. Now, I think it's quite probable that when we start to doubt, we start to fear. Certainly, if the thing or the person or the institution we've always trusted can no longer be counted on, we begin to doubt the reliability of that thing or person. And when we begin to doubt, we begin to be afraid. See, if you can no longer trust the person who made the bridge you're standing on, you become afraid that the bridge will collapse and you will fall into the river over which the bridge is stretched. I'm sure those who trusted Bernie Madoff were confident they would reap thousands of dollars by investing in his financial schemes. They trusted him. But when he was arrested, his followers could no longer trust him, and they began to doubt the schemes he had promoted. The opposite is also true. When we are afraid, we doubt. I know many people who fear flying. They don't want to get into the airplane because they're afraid it will crash. Their fear creates doubt in the stability of the plane or in the ability of the pilot to fly it. Maybe our greatest doubts about matters of religious promises also begin in moments of fear. For at the heart of faith is the promise of the presence of God. But when we cannot feel the presence of God, it's very easy to begin doubting. Not only our understanding, but also the possibility of God's presence at all. When life feels like it is falling apart, regardless of the cause, we don't believe that our well-being is a priority for God. And we begin to fear that what we have been taught is a hoax. And that in reality, we are left to make life work the best way we can, if we can. And we doubt the goodness of God. And we, we may even doubt the existence of God. All of us have felt like those disciples abandoned to a small boat in the middle of the night. And we stretch our fear even further by saying that we're only in this mess because God put us here. Let me give you some examples. A young woman sits shaking her head, tears in her eyes, and she says, I prayed to God that he would lead to me the person that he would want me to marry. And I thought my marriage was the will of God. My husband is a Christian, at least he says so. But he beats me up, and he abuses our children when he's drunk. How could God allow this to happen? A man stands at a graveside after having just buried his wife of 26 years. She was such a good person, he cries. What have I done to deserve this? I went to church regularly. I never hurt my wife or my children. I tried to be obedient to you. God, how could you let this happen to me? And someone nearing retirement 
discovers that the pension plan has been grossly mismanaged and that the financial security counted on will not be there. I've done without all my life to serve you, God. Now I can't even provide for myself in old age. I have nowhere to turn. God, how could you let this happen to me? Doubts. Doubts about a living God. Doubts about a caring God. Doubts about a God who has any wisdom. Doubts about a God who is anything more than a royal figurehead. Doubts about a God who has any power at all. Yes, I think we feel very much like those disciples. Our doubts have turned to fear, and our fear increases our doubt. Well, the disciples, they had had it. Being sent away was bad enough, and the storm on a dark and eerie lake was worse. And now, beyond what they could deal with was what appeared to be a ghost walking toward them on the surface of the water. They thought it was all over. And they began crying out in fear. They doubted their safety. They were afraid for their lives. But a voice coming from that apparition speaks to them. It's Jesus. And he says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And then, impulsive as ever, Peter speaks up. And he said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now tell me, doesn't that seem just a little bit strange to you? Why not say, Lord, if it's you, get us back to shore immediately? Or, Lord, if it's you, give us some sign. Why would this even occur to Peter? Well, we may never know the answer to that. But what we do know is that Jesus thought it was a great idea. And so he says, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. And Peter, Peter is walking on the water toward Jesus. He and the disciples are utterly wide-eyed with amazement. The story is about to come to a happy conclusion when unexpectedly a big gust of wind whips up and distracts Peter, and he's suddenly afraid. In his fear, he begins to sink into the water. Peter asked Jesus to help him walk on water to alleviate his fear. And Jesus readily grants his request. And Peter is walking on the water toward Jesus. All he'd asked for, fully provided. And then the wind comes along and distracts him. Isn't that just like life? We are afraid and we're doubting and God does something wonderful for us. We're so pleased and excited and grateful that we just can't hold it in until some gust of wind comes along. It may be a person, you know, you know the one who comes blustering into your, your life telling you that the dress you just bought on sale could have been purchased down the street for much less. Besides, it doesn't look good on you anyway. Or it might be an incident that blows into your life disturbs your confidence. You're sure you're ready for the exam. You've studied. You've aced the test questions. And then someone points out a section in the text that you only glanced at. And your confidence sinks. And we become unsure again, despite what God has already done for us. But if you have made it to the point of being able to walk on the water because of God's power, why should you care about the wind? Though doubts about some religious claims and assumptions can be important in keeping us honest in our relationship with God, 
there are certain doubts that never let faith do what it was given to us to do. A good many times in our turbulent seas that we call life, we lose our perspective. We begin to think that we don't have the courage to keep going. We don't even feel that we have the strength to keep reaching toward Christ and walking in the power he gives us. But in reality, we're more afloat than we know. It's that wind that keeps distracting us. But if we could just remember this, if you're walking on the water, forget about the wind. But Peter can't seem to forget about the wind, and so he sinks. And he cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And the scripture says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Now, to me, this seems like the most inappropriate place for a lesson. Why did you doubt? From Peter's perspective, there were plenty of reasons to doubt. There was the water, there was the wind, there was his inexperience, and even if his doubts were out of line, he really didn't want to talk about it right then with the water inching up toward his neck. But then again, maybe this was the perfect time to ask, right in the middle of sinking, why doubt? Maybe we ought to have that asked of us when we're ready to throw in the towel. Why doubt? Through faith, in loving and obedient relationship with him, Jesus has brought us this far. Why doubt now? Well, Jesus and Peter get into the boat with the shaky eleven, and the wind is ceased. And in all this dramatic display of power, walking on water, Peter rescued, the storm elements calmed, these witnesses had their faith bolstered. And out on the lake, as the sun was rising on a new day, they worshipped Jesus as the Son of God. There was no longer any room for fear or doubt. So let me suggest this to you. When you are faced with doubts in the midst of your storms, I invite you to remember Peter walking on the water. And remember that if your faith has brought you this far, don't let the wind distract you now. Remember the question Peter was asked by Jesus, why did you doubt? And then, let Jesus take you by the hand once more place you back in his boat and worship him. Amen. May God's Spirit lead us. May God's strength protect us. May God's peace 
be with us. Let us go now in the name of God, by the grace of Christ, and with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen.